I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. So do you remember when you used to go and get your hair cut? And yeah. Come in and you get really annoyed because I and other ladies in the office didn't yeah. notice. No, that's <laughs> that's that's not quite true because I would always compliment a lady when you she got her hair cut. Exactly. And said it was sort of a reverse sexism that I got no attention. Got no attention. But it was really I was fighting for me, for men everywhere, really, rather than for well, myself. Despite how much I've been banging on about them for so long, and every time I see it, you got in your runners, and I didn't notice. No, you didn't. So. So the red ones are gone to the recycling. No, they're not gone. They're, they may... They're there for the gardening. They, uh, yeah. You should just actually cut the cord with things like that. <laughs> I actually think that hanging on to things, thinking, oh, I'll wear them around the house, or I'll wear, just yeah. put them out. Okay, well, I'll consider it. Now, you didn't go with my advice and take the new balance no. ones. Well, I make them visible to they're our just people bla- on They're YouTube. so boring. They're not... <laughs> Well, you know, it, it's almost my calling card now, isn't it? The boring, the boring bit, rather than yeah. But yeah, it is very exciting for I think for all the public to yeah. hear about my new runners. Yeah. Isn't it? But go on. Why did you go for such a boring pair? Because I wanted you to buy those nice blue New yeah. Balance ones, and then I realised they were actually ladies. But I would have yeah. directed you towards. But you see, that would be fashion above yeah. being sensible, right? So. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> I've gone for the the most sensible Shoe. shoes because I have, as you know, as people now, I've been forced to talk about these things. I've gone through a sort of midlife crisis and taken up jogging. Well, fine. And I've okay. got, well. <laughs> it's not really properly. <laughs> well, stuff. well, well. So, and yeah, so my heels get a bit injured. So, so I have, you need I have to have particularly, yes. Yeah. So I looked at the fancy runners, Nicola, you suggested and thought, no. You just went I'm going to go for the sensible option. ones. God, almighty. You'd have to be brought into a shop anyway <laughs> to be pointed in the direction of them. But um, for a man of your years and everything's collapsing, obviously, through your high octane sporting achievements, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, you're not a patch on Mr. Martin Foley going no. around with 14 bullets in his body, having survived numerous assassination attempts. Super fit guy whose actual fitness fanaticism has caused him injury because it's his most kind of routine thing. Every time somebody decides yep. they want to kill him, they go from at one of his yeah. sports. He goes to yoga classes. He does the gym, all the rest of it. But back in the news at 67 for threatening a man, he um, is one of the great survivors of gangland. I mean, goes all the way back to being a part of Martin, the General Cahill's gang, and indeed his childhood friend. Yep. And he's still out there. Um, now, I did check something before we decided we're going to talk about him okay. because we're going to go right back with Foley and okay. we'll have a good discussion about where he came from, what moulded him, made him, and what exactly it is he is. is. But... He's a guy that has an 800,000 euro almost. Is it 700,000? 730,000. 730,000 yeah. bill to the Criminal Assets Bureau, which is a kind of a tax uh, assessment. Yeah. So basically he owes that on money they believe he made through crime, but he owes the tax on it. Yeah, I, I think there was... I never got my head quite around that revenue tax thing with the... Yeah, I mean, that's, bureau. it's, you know, it's unexplained income. Unexplained it? earnings. And yeah, yeah. That it's not, it's not, there's no proof of where those earnings are made, but they still have to pay tax on the earnings is the idea. And I think he's been hit with a lot of uh, interest payments. Yeah, because that bill has been knocking that. around for a long time. And I was wondering, you know, is he... Has he paid it now? Because, But no, he hasn't. So no. it's still outstanding. And the reason I really was interested in that was because... What he's actually been back before the courts for, um, now you'll have to help me out here, but I did my remedial maths on this and he was looking to recover uh, unpaid rent from a a tenant in a house down in Wexford. Yeah. This incident happened in June of 2020 and the unpaid rent was 40, sorry, 4,000, right? Uh, a 68 year old man owed this money and uh, it appeared that the landlord employed the Viper Recovery Services or whatever he's currently operating uh, yep. the company name on. So 
they actually, if you look at what they do, they get 20% of what is recovered. So had they got the four I'm grand... I'm smiling now. No, no, no. I think I got this right. Go I on. think I got this right. Okay. So this is definitely like third third class, fourth class mathematics. Yeah, but I, I'm actually going to pass this. Go on. I think, well, I hope. So had they got this 20% of the four grand, it yeah. would have been 800 euro. 800 euro. Am I right? My heart actually yes, stopped there yes. a little bit and I went, Jesus, if I said this well now, done. to the nation and it's wrong. So, and there was two of them. So they would have had to divide two. that, which would work out 400 each. Say they were going 50-50 on it. Yeah. 400 euro each. And then presumably he does pay his tax now, given that he's already got this massive tax bill. He'd probably have to pay you know, 150 quid yeah. of that in tax. So he, his and I doubt his earnings he, would have been 250. And then he'd have to pay his... his I doubt he gets diesel. mileage, would he, or, no. or anything like that. No. So that, I mean, I think that's what the scale... But that's what he's out working for now. That's what he's out working for. And he's not uh, retiring, is he? He's 60, no. he's of retirement he's age. I know this is a couple of years ago, 2020. So, yeah, he's, this is... This is what he has. Yeah, this is where his, his career has ended. Yeah, and of course, then it's not just the small amounts of money. There's obviously the hazard of, of dealing with things like this, which obviously ended up in in, in a courthouse. Um, he is he pled guilty. He was initially charged with threat to kill. That was dropped, and he's been uh, convicted of uh, threatening and abusive behaviour, mm -hmm. effectively, which is a relatively small charge with a maximum sentence of a couple of months in prison. I think threatening it is. and abusive behaviour. Yeah, with with with, an, with with the aim of breaching the peace. Yeah. So I mean, it's a low level charge. Very much so. Yeah. However, he could face a, a prison sentence, which I can't. Looking back, it must be 30, 40 years since he's been behind bars. Yeah. Now, he's had a few run-ins with the law and been arrested here and there. Um, he was arrested in a jewellery shop a few years ago in a dispute with the shop owner. But yeah, he's in danger going back to prison at his age mm. over a couple of hundred quid. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where we, he sort of, we're at now. But let's go back to the beginning because it, it definitely didn't start on small pittance no. of money for uh, certain things that he's doing. He would have always been well known for throughout his career. He's been a kind of a heavy, an enforcer, a volatile individual who's regularly threatened and probably quick with his fists and all the rest of it. But back to where it started. He's originally from Derry. Yeah. And he's one of five children who moved to the parents moved and settled in Crumlin. Um, and so he's, I'm not going to try and work out when that was. Well, I think he was 11 yeah. years old when he when he settled in Crumlin. So what year are you talking? Um, so you're talking in the 1960s, aren't you? He says confidently. No, not fully confidently. Yeah, well, yeah. It, w yeah, it would have been yeah. the 1960s into the 70s. Yeah. yeah. So um, he settled there at a time of extreme poverty in that neighbourhood and yeah. it would have been a new neighbourhood. Crumlin. Would have been one of the, the the wave of sort of corporation built housing complexes, and you know a lot of bring people, people out of the city centre. A lot of people moved tenement. out. Yeah, in, in a lot of what sort of West Dublin, Crumlin, Dream. Now a lot of those areas were settled. I mean, they were built before that probably, um, but it was part of the a, a move, a gradual move from people out out of the tenements of Dublin city centre, where people were living mm. in really unsafe conditions, and the the state post war. Engaged, built a lot of homes. Um, yeah. And so Crumb, as the kids grew up, these were all newly settled. There was, I suppose, some of them got in trouble. Yeah. Um, and Martin well, Foley. A family moved in down the road, of course, yeah. from from Foley's, from the Foley's of Derry. And they were the Cahals, the yeah. Martin Cahals family, big family of um, boys mainly, weren't yeah. they? About eight or ten of them. Yeah, and Cahals. there was some of them, um, I think Martin Cahal was a couple of years younger than Martin Foley. Um, not much in the difference. Obviously, some of Martin Cahal's brothers as well were became ultimately became involved in that first wave of armed robbers, organized armed robbers. Uh, obviously, some of them have since passed away and some mm. of them moved away from life of crime. But Martin Foley and 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 uh, Martin Cahill would go on to become really, really famous. The first real, uh, I suppose... Gangland superstars almost. Gangland superstars. The yeah. first 
people, I mean, I remember them growing up and you remember yeah. them growing up, uh, seeing them on the front of the Herald, not really fully known what was going on. This is the 1980s, but they were, they became Ireland's first celebrity criminals, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously there have been the Duns maybe be around the same time, but they were like national figures. Yeah. And, um, and of course they came sort of of age at a time when the Guardi would have been very focused on the IRA. And they would have been very much, their time was caught up really with fighting terrorism as opposed to what crime has now become, a kind of a version of terrorism, hasn't it? A narco-terrorism. But back then it was kind of, uh, they were just, you know, very engaged, huge amount of intelligence around the subversives, around the IRA, around their leadership, around their activities. They had to be, obviously, because they, they were capable of doing anything and of causing mass murder. Um. And that was the kind of environment that the likes of Cahal and Foley came into. Um, now, Foley himself actually had a trade as a tire fitter before, but I think he was kind of doing the armed robbery on the side. And they were very anti-establishment. Yeah, I mean, I Cahill think... Cahal and Foley. I think Cahal was a really unique character, whatever mm. way you look at it. And Foley was, they they had a lifelong friendship, I think, up until they till Cahal was shot, but... I think he really, uh, Foley really followed in his wake. I mean, Martin Cahill, obviously everybody knows about him, probably seen the films, but a really sort of uh, unusual character to spring up. And he was driven not just solely by 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 maybe greed and that, he was driven by a kind of a sort of bizarre philosophy of, of, of getting one over, I think, on mm. the state as well. Um, also sort of attention seeking, I suppose, or publicity driven criminality in a sense. Uh, he seemed to embrace that in a way that that was unusual. And it all created a kind of... Uh, a bit of ego tied up in that though, really. When yeah. When you think about it, the the, the idea of beating the yeah. state, the systems, the police, the, you know, the forensic labs, the beating the court system, beating the social yeah. welfare system. And if you remember, of, of course, a lot of that, the, the Martin Cahill crew had, had been brutalised by the state, I think, you know. I think um, nearly all of them had gone to those institutions. Borstals, not, they weren't called borstals at the time. And they were brought up in abject poverty. Yeah. A lot of them were brought up in homes where, I mean, multiplied by the poverty, there was alcoholism, so that made them their childhoods even more impoverished. And they went out to rob to feed themselves and their brothers and sisters. And like, you know, the Duns would be the same. And in a way, Jerry Hutch would sort of yeah, I mean, these be were of people, that similar start in life, you know, yeah, I mean, marginalised. Marginal, but put in these institutions, um, most of Martin Cahill's gang were criminalised at a really, really young age, put in institutions in 13, 14, 15 years old. Everybody knows what went on in those institutions now. I mean, the, 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 these are kids who are absolutely uh, put through the ringer. And I think that, you know, they were brutalised, like no mm-hmm. doubt about it. And I, I was think- talking to somebody of late who was in one of those borstals, um, yeah. somebody who would be known within the criminal underworld. And they actually said to me that it was great because he got fed. Yeah. So yeah. in other words, the, the being brutalized and there didn't actually matter because the hunger was worse. Yeah. So at least when you got into these institutions, you got three square meals a day. Yeah. Like that's a kind of a poverty that I don't know. Does that exist in modern Ireland? Well, it probably does exist in, in, in it does exist in bits. I mean, there, it's, there, there is, it, it certainly does if there's dysfunction around children growing up. Yeah. Where they can't access, there are obviously it would all be, that would be largely tied up in the modern world in addiction. Yes, or or other types of dysfunction or trauma I going think on in the background. Nowadays, unlike back then, kids aren't really allowed to drop out of school. That there are services. Yeah, but I mean, people. I know a lot of them fall through the cracks, but there are dash schools that have food there. I'm I'm talking really basic kind of stuff. Actually, being fed, of course, in homes where there's addiction and abuse and stuff. Um, yeah, look, I mean, there's more poverty than anywhere else, but yeah, I mean, look, the, these things still go on. Let's let's these be kids realistic. back then were like literally were they weren't finishing national school, let alone no secondary school. There was 
very little policing of that. There was very ha- heavy handed well, policing. Well, I mean, if, if you look at now, well. even now you have uh, the state taking kids off parents and all the trauma and putting, mm. you know, I mean, all of that is deeply traumatic for children to go through that. But if you look at back then, those kids were being treated as criminals yeah. when that same dysfunction was going on and they were put being put in these places. And I think Martin Cahill, by his own words, had a kind of a reaction against that where the state became his enemy. Mm. And he's not alone in that in, in the criminal world where s- certain criminals have that, that attitude mm. that they are at war with the with the with the police with the the courts with all of those things i think foley uh became um his somebody that he'd known all his life he put a great deal of trust in the people that that he could trust in terms of their loyalty i think foley as well served as being uh, somebody who was frightening to people who was capable of violence who was uh who he was a boxer he was a boxer and people mm. feared him and knew of his reputation. And I think Martin Cahill used him for that. Um, yeah. Most certainly, I think he was a, his enforcer as well as somebody yeah. who was believed to have been on a number of these very famous yeah. armed robberies. Um, and Art House, of course, which is where enter John Trainer, the late John Trainer, who was part of John Gilligan's gang. It seems to me that, um, you know, I'm sure somebody who was working more around these times would know this. Exactly, more exactly. But it seems to me that you had John Gilligan's gang, um, you had the Cahill gang. They sort of worked together sometimes. Sometimes they swapped information. They helped one another out. Uh, they were obviously all involved in robberies of big commercial robberies, um, jewellery stores. In the case of John Gilligan, it was factories. Um, but it was John Trainer who supplied... Cahill with information about the O'Connor's jewellers, yeah. um, which used to have vast amounts of cash. And it was Cahill and suspected that Foley, along with him, went and robbed O'Connor's jewellers as money was being moved. And it was two million pounds. Yeah, which is, I mean, it was an absolute level above anything that had ever occurred of that type at that time in Ireland. This is 1983. So if you look back at that, I mean, it did the, the the scale of inflation, it, it was an absolute phenomenal amount of money. And I think as well, obviously, armed robberies have been commonplace through the 70s and, and the early 80s, but there was a degree of planning and of preparation, um, and it really built their reputation as as a, a league above what was going on. I mean, some of the, the people involved, people like Shavo Hogan and John Trainer. I mean, these people... That was 1983. We'd still be writing about them 30 yeah. years later. And obviously not Shavo Hogan was ultimately shot dead. But, you know, it was, it it put them into the big time mm. um, and they made a huge amount of money off it. Now, the IRA were in the mix in the ether and were really the overlords of everybody back then. We've spoken recently about how that balance, sort of that power balance shifted completely around the time of the 2016, the Regency, you can really see it, how it's shifted by then. Um, But at that time, the IRA were, they pretty much took a cut from everybody who was doing anything. Um, They would sometimes, I imagine, be involved, sometimes not. uh, But everybody had to sort of adhere to their rules and their conditions. And Cahill and Gilligan and all the rest of it regularly sort of fell into disfavour of the IRA or they, they had difficulties with them. Presumably that was all over money and power. But a year after the, or two years rather, after the O'Connor's jewellery heist, um, Martin Foley was kidnapped by yeah. the IRA and a, an eyewitness saw it happening, called the police and they, they sort of trailed the, he was very lucky actually, for somebody who's so anti-establishment, they trailed the van that he was in um, to, as far as the Phoenix Park, there was a shootout and, and he was basically rescued by the Gardaí. Yeah, I mean, he'd, be, he'd been, they'd called to his door with a sawn-off shotgun, four guys. He'd fought with the guy with the shotgun. They'd beaten him up with, with uh, baseball bats or something like that. He'd fought them again. They dragged him upstairs. He managed to escape. It went, you know, he really battled them. Yeah. And eventually, through all of this, they managed to bundle him into a van 
And as they were driving off, somebody had seen all this commotion, which went on and on. And uh, well, presumably, then the fact that he fought them so long and yeah. caused such commotion saved yeah. his life rather than saved his look. life. Um, but it was, yeah, it was that was the balance of power. The IRA saw this gang make two million quid. They wanted their cut. Um, they were probably less involved in direct uh, armed robberies at this at this stage because uh, though they continued to be involved and there's obviously some notorious incidents. But they expected a cut, and Martin Cahill, in particular. Uh, pushed against that. Mm -hmm. Gilligan fell in and out with them, but he, his gang really did accept the, the authority of the IRA. Um, but Cahill certainly, and that ultimately probably cost him his life uh, when he was shot dead by the IRA himself in, in the mid-90s. It was the, the, the pushback he gave to them. Like that sort of a robbery, two million and the jewellery. I mean, O'Connor's jewellery heist is one of the most famous. It remains yeah. one of the most famous. Um, you couldn't sort of pretend you didn't do that. I mean, everybody within the criminal underworld and the paramilitary world would have known exactly who carried it out, who was capable of it. Only a finite amount of people would be capable of the kind of work, shall we say, that the Cal gang did. Um, but they, you know, probably smaller, given the very nature of criminals, if they did smaller robberies that yeah. weren't kind of making the news or the headlines, they presumably weren't going to hand over the money to the IRA anyway. No, but I think this, yeah, know? it was the size of it and also it's maybe nice. maybe seen as a, as a you know, they didn't get permission or they didn't seek to ask permission before doing it. Now, around this same time in, in the 1980s, of course, the, the heroin epidemic had hit Dublin and um, the concerned parents against drugs had got together. I think that movement had started in Hardwick Street and it had moved into a lot of the other flat complexes and they had established a pattern where they marched on the homes of known drug dealers. I mean, I think in the case of Tommy Savage, they left a coffin outside his house and there were others that they ordered them out of flat complexes yeah. out in Ballymun and all the rest of it. But they sort of wrongly marched on the homes of... Uh, Cahill and Foley, yeah. which angered them, well, certainly on Foley, and it angered them to such an extent um, that Cahill ordered his men to go out and to create the Concerned Criminal Action Committee. Yeah, yeah. So to counteract that, I mean, this is just the kind of inside the mind of, of Cahill, the bizarre... Yeah ego-driven mind of Cahill. But so he got his own sort of network together and got them to march on the homes of the concerned parents. Yeah, yeah. They were concerned criminals that yeah. were being kind of outed wrongly as drug dealers. And Foley was involved in that, of course. I'm sure that all blew up and died down quickly yeah. enough. But but he was kind of the front man for it, actually, yeah. Foley. Um, like at that stage, the, the Cahill gang weren't involved in drugs in 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 fairness, um, though many of them would go on to become extremely uh, serious players in the drugs drugs business. As well, like the concerned parents against drugs, there was a, a kind of an IRA aspect to that as well, wasn't there? I mean, that's something that's still debated how much of a hand the IRA had in, in those, some of those organisations because there was a multiple different mm -hmm. versions of, of concerned parents. So those concerned parents were given uh, sort of a, a, the backing of some provosts when they approached these drug dealers and told that they'd back them up. So all of that was going on and yeah. Martin Cahill was also fighting back against yeah. the IRA or at least what he perceived as being the hand Amazing of the IRA on really. this. And of course then he was, you know, not to state the obvious, but he was openly embracing the 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 yeah. title of being a criminal and, and that was the were the ordinary decent criminals, which I think they made a film, didn't they, about Martin Cahill uh besides the more famous one called Ordinary Decent Criminal. Yeah. Um, because that was a moniker that they they wanted to have, you know. I'm just trying to get my timeline right on this. I have some notes in front of me because I'm going to throw something else into okay. the mix, which is you have obviously the, you know, they've, they've done the O'Connor's jewellery heist. They're kind of becoming celebrity criminals almost. Yep. They've gone out and fought back against the concerned parents saying yeah. they're concerned criminals. Um, there's a guy called Paddy Shanahan. Yeah. And he comes to Foley in the aftermath of that 1984 kidnapping, which results in his being freed up in the Phoenix Park. And he says to them, he's an idea about these stealing these Dutch masters 
yeah. paintings, which are in a house called Rusbra in County Wicklow, owned by a couple by the name of Bites, is it? B I T. Yeah, the yeah. Bites, and they are these very fabulously rich, um, uh, sort of aristocratic, aristocratic sort of who, who are couple who yeah. are actually go on to leave those paintings to the Irish state, yeah, but who are living in this huge big mansion in Wicklow with very little security on it and probably, you know, w on the walls are hanging millions and millions yep. and millions of euro worth of their art collection. Um, now, Paddy Shanahan was known as the builder. Yep. And Paddy Shanahan, uh, a little bit earlier than this, was arrested in the UK yep. along with a guy called Jim Mansfield yeah. Sr. Yeah. And they were involved in some building or buying of construction stuff and they were caught on a kind of a vat fraud. Yeah, was it, was, it, was it to do with the Falklands Islands or some sort of... Was it to do with that machinery that was left over that yeah. was supposed to have made Mansfield Senior his early wealth that became yeah, the, that he, what he built his empire on? Exactly. But Paddy Shanahan and Jim Mansfield go way back and had gone way back at this stage. And of course, Mansfield Senior had a lifelong interest in fine art, shall we say. Yeah. And in... Um, you know, in where it was and where it was housed in these yeah. big, huge houses around Ireland. Um, so it was Paddy Shanahan who came to them with the idea of stealing these Dutch masters. Obviously, he had the information of where they were and what they were, or what was yeah. on the walls, but he could, he needed them to um, carry out the robbery. Yeah. And the first robbery on the Bight residence in Rusborough happened in 1986. Yeah. Now, there was absolute priceless art yeah. stolen. Um, I think Martin Cahill himself had gone down to the house to visit because they had look, open days yeah. when people were allowed to come in to see the, the, the and he'd a look at where everything was and what it was, presumably on the advice of Paddy Shanahan mm. and uh, in the background there in the ether somewhere is Mansfield Senior and his knowledge of the art world. Yeah. Um, so Cahill went in, had a look, and then he s constructed a plan. And the plan was to set off the alarms in the house. There was some security yeah. on it. He set off the alarms. The police either came or certainly called to make sure everything was OK. It was deemed that it was a false alarm. So they left the alarms off, off I think. Yeah. And matter. the police went back to their station, wherever it was, happy in the knowledge that there was nothing. And like... Anybody who grew up in Ireland, childhood in the yeah. 1980s, the 90s, will just remember the constant ding of alarms yeah, yeah, because... Yeah. People ignored them. People just ignored people them. People still do, of course, you know. Well, they ignore fire alarms, but I mean, they used to ignore house alarms. Yeah, they like to yeah. think they don't anymore yeah. because they don't go off as much. They're much more well, sophisticated. They weren't, yeah, they weren't necessarily connected to... to, to Call centers. No, they weren't. Con that's probably yeah. right. Yeah. They weren't connected to call centers. Yeah. But I remember like summer childhoods playing outside yeah. and just getting used to the yeah. ringing in your ear yeah. because people would go out to work. The alarm would go off just as they drove off to the edge of the world <laughs> and it would be going all day long. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, it was a different time, really. That sounds like a very sort of quaint story to tell, but that was the truth of it. Yeah. They came out, checked the alarms, realised it was a false alarm, off they went, and in went Cahill and his gang and took what they what they wanted. Um, and that resulted in the setup a year later of the Tango Squad because Cahill and his gang and Foley had become such menaces to society and an embarrassment to the police. Yeah, so they they become national figures. I mean, I think it was, was it RTE and Today Tonight or, or yeah. somebody like that doorstepping Martin Cahill outside court. And they did great work back then. They did. Do you remember Today they did. Tonight? They did. And I remember being on the Herald. I remember being in a school kid and people talking about the general and stuff. Yeah. And uh, But yeah, they doorstepped him and he gave great quotes. I can't remember what they were exactly. And didn't he pull down his pants, pants and all of that sort of stuff. So he reveled in it. I mean, it's incredible when you look back, you talk about Jim Mansfield Sr., I mean, one of the guys uh, who's suspected of being involved in the O'Connor's robbery was uh, a guy called John Cunningham. Yeah. Who would go on 
I mean, when did we last write about him? The last mo- few weeks. Yeah, he went on to become the right hand man of Christy Kinahan. And one of the Paddy Shanahan, the builder, as you talk, he went on to become a very by loads of properties around the Buckingham Street area, which of course all of that area featured so heavily in the Regency yeah. trial that we've just just finished and possibly we'll never talk about again. But all yeah. these characters, like yeah. they they. They're like, I mean, it's almost that like was it's a tapestry, it's a dance. They're yeah. constantly, is it because our country is so small and used to be even smaller and the criminal underworld was so small, there were these key figures in it and they're always but that's, intermingling. And yeah, I mean, that's 40 years later. Yeah. 1983, we have had so far this year, we've definitely had Martin Folio this weekend. We've had John Cunningham recently. Yeah. We've had Buckingham Street. We've had Mansfield. Yeah. I mean, that's so it is they probably were a kind of a unique generation of 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 criminals in a way um, that they they had a certain longevity and, rem- and you know, remained mm-hmm. uh, involved. I suppose it's something equivalent to sort of the craze in London uh, yeah. generation earlier. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the, the, the Russ Bra House um, robbery, though, I think these things became an offence against the state. And we see this from time to time. I mean, the Regency, again, was something similar where all of a sudden sort of normal civil society wakes up and thinks we can't allow this to go on in the way it's gone on. Or is it that it's so embarrassing for the police? But that's what I mean. No, that's what I mean. It's embarrassing for the police, but it's embarrassing for the politicians. The politicians yes. call the shots, yeah. tell the police this can't go on. And no. that is... That is what happened then. It happened ultimately with the Guinans that the political class woke up and thought mm-hmm. this isn't something that's confined to certain areas. This is something that that's that we're 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 being embarrassed by and we're not gonna allow it to continue. And then the state, I think that was what was it, nineteen eighty seven, they started to grind down the cattle gang through mm-hmm. Tango One policing, which has become a really famous thing as well. Yeah. Um, I think you see it in the in that the film, the general, which great film, where you just see the police constantly outside their house. Mm. They don't have any massively sophisticated plan, other than just follow all the main guys and never leave them alone. Put them under pressure. Yeah, put yeah. them under pressure, Jack Charlton. And of course, they have, um, you know, in the in the movie, Cal is in visiting his pigeons, and yeah. they're kind of looking over looking over the wall and all the rest of it. However truthful that is, but that I mean, that was. Uh, a kind of a policing plan that mm. still happened in Limerick as well in terms of just getting on top of them. Yeah, and certainly is is one that seems to work repeatedly no matter yeah. what era. But interestingly, when, you know, the Tango squad, the establishment of it and what would later happen in Limerick and in other places, the kind of the one of the, 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 the reasons for it is to put them under that pressure. Yeah. Because once they're under pressure, especially volatile individuals, they will make mistakes. And that's exactly what Foley did after yeah. the Tango Squad was established in 1987. He is somebody, I mean, we're talking about him, that he's just been to court and pled guilty to threatening um Somebody for, yeah. to try and in relation re- to a dr- in, in relation, relation to, to a death, death okay. collection of a death. So there's a kind of a you know I mean there's a kind of a, 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 a sort of an element of a bully there, right? Yeah. And back when Tango was established, he couldn't cope with the the being Tangoed as such, yeah. and he beat up a few guardie. Yeah. Now he went on the run to the UK. He was uh, he was charged here. Yeah. And he had to be extradited from the UK. And that, again, is exactly the point of those tangoing operations. You get them for whatever you can, yeah. even if it's a public order offence. You yeah. start racking up the offences against them as you're building the bigger case. Yeah. So they're going in and out of prison. You're breaking up the kind of the cell structure that is their gang. And it's very effective. So um, Foley was jailed for, for two years after being extradited from the States. Um, and... Uh, sorry, from the UK. And obviously, you know, as time went on, Cahill became, you know, he was still under heavy investigation by police. The Tango Squad didn't continue for ever. Yeah. But by 1994, Cahill was in a bad place with... Yeah, he had health problems as well as everything else. He was, But with the IRA, he, he was, was in a yes, bad place with he, the IRA. He was become... I think, very paranoid in the last few years of his life. So he started falling out with all these people, uh, including people like Shavo Hogan, 
uh, who was Martin Foley, a very close friend of Martin Foley. He thought he was uh, b- had become an informer. So he became, and yeah, he was started, very paranoid about him. And yeah, and ultimately, he the IRA were putting him under pressure. I think to do with the paintings, where they were, uh, about money, and because many of them have never been recovered. No. Yeah. And no. they all recovered eventually. I can't remember because it was two robberies and we're going to come to the There's two robberies. Some of them are definitely missing. Yeah. Um, some of them are definitely still. There is some of them definitely still missing. Yeah. There's no doubt. One or two of them, I think. Yeah. Um, and there was all sorts of stories that they were buried out in the woodlands and were they going to be protected and all this. But in the run up to him being shot dead by the IRA in 1994, Cahill, of course, John Gilligan had decided that armed robberies were a thing of the past. Yeah. These kind of crimes were just so, so high risk. If you're caught doing them, you're going to get a really hefty sentence and you're all caught. And they're probably not worth the reward anymore because, of course, drugs were very much on the landscape. Yeah. And Gilligan had spent a period in prison. He had met up with uh, John Trainer, yeah. I believe, and had been kind of introduced maybe to his, the first of his contacts in Amsterdam who would supply him with cannabis. Yeah. What he needed was an amount of money to go and buy his first sort of import deal. Yeah. And he went to Cahill because he didn't have the money himself. And Cahill allegedly, as story goes, gave Gilligan the money. So he got kind of involved in yeah. the drug business. Is that what angered the IRA? Was there other stuff about the paintings? It's probably a mixture of everything. Yeah. I mean, this is all the big disputed territory, isn't it? Yeah. Whether, you know, Gilligan spoke to the IRA, you know. Wanted to have his debt wiped out, which it was essentially yeah. when Cahill was shot. And that's what put Gilligan into the big league so quickly because the 300,000, for example, or whatever it was that he borrowed to go and buy his first, he didn't just take the profits, he took that as well. Yeah. So he had nothing owed. No, and this is, of course, when he was starting off, so there wasn't that sort of buying it on credit or anything like that. So it was a big investment and it paid off big time, obviously, for him. But either way, I mean, there's no dispute, I think, that the IRA killed Martin mm. Cahill. Um, a lot of people... Belgrave Square in Ranala. Yeah, very close to his home in in in, in, in the area. Um, huge moment, I think, yeah. for in, in gangland history. Um, the IRA claimed responsibility and um, John Gilligan then was really in the clear. Um, he'd always been a kind of a junior aspect, junior to, to Martin Cahill. Martin Cahill was, you know, the most famous and well-known criminal and it kind of acted as a sort of godfather figure, mm. settling disputes between other criminals. They'd gone to him as a kind of man of respect. And once he was eliminated, um, John Gilligan became the number one criminal figure in Ireland in, in very, very quickly. Um, and within two years, they had had managed to build up a business that, you know, there was a figure thrown out during his court cases that he was making 20 million profit and yeah. made 20 million profit. Yeah. Profit within two years. What other? And that was just cannabis. Yeah. Anyway, a couple of months after Cahill was shot in 94, Paddy Shanahan was shot dead. Yeah. Now, was that IRA related as well? I can't remember. We might need to go and... Um, well, there was never... It was, it, was, it, was, it was never fully clear. Um, like, Shanahan then started... At that point, it started making a lot of money as a, as a, as a developer, a property developer, mm. and had been making more money from property development than, than true crime. But there was money... You know, there was a lot of disputes about about money and that's a bit more murky. Um, mm. But in this time, uh, Martin Foley had started to re-emerge then as, um, as, and was being linked to the drug trade, really the cannabis trade, something that he has always denied and mm. gone to court denying. Nonetheless, he had he had moved into that that world as well, according to most people in the underworld sources at the time. Now, in ninety five and ninety six, he's shot. Yeah, both occasions he survives. Yeah, um, you know, quite serious attempts in his life, and Gilligan believed to be behind it. They're the two occasions. Yeah, Brian I mean, Meehan attacks him. Yeah, Brian Meehan uh, and another very well-known member of the Gilligan gang had attempted to shoot him um, in, in Crumlin. In Is his, he uh, attempting to, I wonder, to claim back the debt that was owed to Cahill well, there was a dis- what's going on there? Well, I mean, th- there's the underworld rumours at the time was that 
uh, the Gilligan gang had decided to shoot Foley because Foley had been melting off. Uh, another thing that people always say about Martin Foley, rightly or wrongly, that he's gossipy and that he, you know, but apparently he had told the IRA that the Gilligan gang had moved into heroin dealing. Heroin dealing. This is disputed big time and that had put the the Gilligan gang in the line of fire for the IRA who would tolerate cannabis uh, but would not tolerate uh, people selling heroin in the inner city communities that they relied on for support. Um, so apparently Brian Mean and another associate who'd, who'd end up in court as well in a very serious crime uh, had targeted Martin Foley. Um, but again, he survived. Because he's as hard as nails and he go, you know, he fights back. He's like a little Rothweiler, isn't he? he? But he is. I and mean, very fit. I mean, yeah. that's not just... I Though mean, I always f- f- love this one. I remember working in a tabloid uh, newspaper in the 2000s and somebody saying, yeah, Martin Foley survived another shooting because he's so fit. Yeah. I was thinking, really? <laughs> Like how thick can you be? But you certainly well, had no, a... No, sur- because they say when somebody has built a lot of muscle, yeah. that it protects the organs from bullets at times that the, the the bullet will, you know, lodge within the muscle and not reach the vital organ. Because obviously if you're shot yeah. and the bullets don't go through your vital organs, you have quite a high chance of survival. Could be so to do with bad quality weapons as well or, or, or be, bad quality hitmen. I don't know if he's, his muscles were that an, big. No, there's an element of that about the muscle, to and, be honest with you, and the fitness. And obviously, you, well, I think if you can keep moving if somebody's well, shooting, well, this that's is, what you should do, by the way. If somebody's shooting at you, you should keep moving. Keep trying to, to not certainly stand still and become a target. I did and always feel, though, that sometimes it was it was like he was Superman. He could repel the bullets yeah, through, a, through, a, a, through a, a flex of the bicep. Well, listen, come on. He's 14 bullets in his body. Like, I mean, yeah. that is a pretty extraordinary Well, I will, I, will, I will say he had a great survival instinct. Great. I mean, just extraordinary. Anyway, by June 2000, Rusborough House, the bike couple are hit again um, in another robbery. This time it's suspected that it's Foley and Shavo Hogan. Yeah. And Hogan and Foley had actually become very close in prison when Foley was extradited back from the UK that time after beating up the guardi, the Garda. And um, while Cahill had turned on Hogan and believed he was an informer, Foley kind of, the two of them, hooked up really. Yeah. And they were suspected of carrying out that Rusper House um robbery again. Foley yeah. will always deny yeah. anything to do with it. Um but a month after that robbery and all of the artwork in that case was retrieved by recovered by the Gardaí. The paintings this time were recovered, but a month later Hogan was shot dead outside the transport club in Crumlin. Now, I'm very aware of that Hogan shooting. Yeah. Um, wherever I was in my journalism at the time. Yeah. I remember knowing a lot about him. Um, I remember writing about him and I believe when he was in prison that time, Cahill had ordered for him to be attacked. I think probably to be murdered when he believed yeah. he was an informer. And he had had his ears shaped yeah. like a rat yeah, and had them, you know, sliced and stuff. And I, maybe that's why he stood out to me. Yeah. Shavo Hogan. Um, and I also met somebody who had had uh, something awful happen to them. And this individual told me that Hogan had looked after them. Yes. Yeah. He was nice. It was probably the first time I was starting to properly get in under the, the, the headlines of the right. underworld and learning that these people were human beings with good side and bad sides, yeah. that they were, yeah. you know, they had lived these crazy you know, violent lives, but they also had an ability sometimes to be show a certain yeah loyalty. Would you call it kindness? It was to the community. It was so, I suppose, that whole sense that Robin Hood style thing. Yeah, they were baddies, but they were goodies to their own. Yeah, and they looked after neighbors and you know women who'd been left on their own and that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. no, that's I was very aware of Hogan, and I suppose was writing about all these characters back then. Which is now 23 years ago. Yeah. And uh, yeah, as you say, here we are still talking about him. Now, shortly after this time, Foley, who was emerging as a bigger figure than ever, he was no longer a secondary character. He was no longer just the enforcer of a gang. He was, you know, an individual of his own right. He went to war with the Sunday world. Yeah. um, Because the Sunday world was writing about him and um, they had some sort of a story about uh, that who he was and, you know, how he'd 
basically not being caught a few times yeah. when he was close to drugs, seizures. Yeah. They were they were linking him to drug dealing, which he didn't like. And the newspaper, I think Paul Williams, the crime correspondent at the time, was writing a lot about him. Yeah. And he went really heavily to war with the Sunday world. He brought the paper to court, tried to have uh, reporting on him banned, yeah. uh, saying that they were putting his life at risk. Yeah, there was mention of the IRA as well in some of the pieces and his relationship with them. And that's, he was saying that he was being put at risk of... Of being shot dead, yeah. basically. And yeah. there was this totally, it was Michael O'Higgins actually defended him yeah. or was representing him rather. And he was saying it was the most, you know, like the most dangerous reporting yeah. you could ever imagine. Of course, yeah. um, the Sunday World won the case. Yeah. And shortly after that, there was an incident around where Williams was living when there was a hoax bomb put under his car. Yeah. And he and 150 of his neighbours had to be evacuated yeah. while the army came in and made sure that it was always safe. Horrendous yeah. uh, situation to find yourself in as a crime correspondent. And Williams was put under protection at that stage yeah. because of this, I suppose, this this, this assault or this this. Yeah, this Perceived. attack on yeah attack on reporting and remember by Foley like you yeah, know by Foley and Foley of obviously was investigated and suspected but yeah. never charged oh, no, he was never convicted. charged in relation to it um, but um, now so throughout the two thousands he is sort of operating under cover but he's popping up all over the place in relation to suspected of being involved in this that and the other yeah and he's given the nickname of the Viper. Yeah. By the media. Yeah. Um, and that's because it was because in essentially his moustache and he has that sort of look about him. Yeah. Vipery, you know. Um, and of course, I think he complained about that when he took the Sunday World to court to yeah. try and gag the paper. But then he took that on. He started to claim ownership of that name, the Viper. And in around the late, the end of the 2000s, he sets up the Viper Recovery and Debt Services. Yeah. So he's going legit yeah, he's setting up a company himself and his then partner, now partner, uh, who's a younger woman. Well, I think initially he set it up with Troy Jordan, right, who was also a, a suspected criminal, and we've written about many times. Good contact and yeah. of Ga Gilligan. Good contact of Gilligan and somebody who looked after Gilligan's land, didn't he? When he was yeah. going through his legal co uh, battles. So Troy Jordan and him set it up. Ultimately, uh, they both resigned as directors and uh, Foley's uh, now wife was brought on mm -hmm. uh, as a director. I mean, in this time, Foley, uh, he, you know, in 2000, he'd survived another uh, shooting attempt outside uh, a gym in, in, in Terenure, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, when was that? Was that not 2000? He survived. 2008. So it's 2008 outside the Carlisle gym and that shooting was believed to have been carried out weirdly by his nephew, James Quinn, who's now in jail in Spain um, yeah, serving a life sentence for the murder of Gary That's Hunch. right. So there was first in September 2000, there was a, another attempt on his life. That was at the Terenure swimming pool. That, that was at the yeah. Terenure swimming pool. Yeah, you're pool. right. And he was, he was ultimately shot and just shot really at quite close range, but managed to just get hit in the ankle. Right. And that was always a bit unclear about who it was, but um, really that attempted shooting and the shooting in 2008 were both linked to what were, what are, were the Kinnan gang, really. Mm -hmm. And some of it, um, according to Underworld sources, was driven by the fact that there had been uh, a seizure um, in continental Europe. There'd been a drugs a drug seizure and a cash seizure um, that were, according to Underworld sources, Foley was in dispute with John Cunningham. Right. John Cunningham at that stage and, you know, for many, many years afterwards would have been Christy Kinnahan Sr.'s absolute right-hand man. you say man. in dispute, Cunningham was blaming Foley yeah, on saying, touting, basically? No, no, blaming him on saying, you owe me this money, that money was right. seized, but it's, you know, I my end of the business had been done, you owe me that money. Foley had refused to pay, saying, no, that was your responsibility. These things actually go on quite a lot in, mm -hmm. in gangland. So there'd been a dispute, according to sources, of a better, over a bill of about 100,000 euros. Mm. Foley had, at that stage, was deeply involved in with some of the, the, the Crumlin and Drimna figures. Obviously felt like he was big enough 
to refuse to pay. Um, that shooting in 2000 was an attempt by the Kinahan organisation to kill him, basically, for mm. that debt. Um, and it wasn't forgotten. I mean, that's really what happened, isn't it? By 2008. I'm certainly, I'd be sure of the 2008 shooting being the Kinahan organisation being behind that. The 2001, I have also heard that that was a Provo plot again. So, I mean, th- that that era, the 2000s, the Kinahans were really only establishing themselves. They were, um, but Cunningham was already yeah, a, no, a he big was, player. He would have been, he would have um, been in jail at the time in, in um, the Netherlands after he was, and Christy Kinahan. Look, again. Either way. Either way. It was one or the other. But by 2008, when he was shot outside the Carlisle gym, he was definitely in dispute at that point with the Kinahan organization. With the, directly with the top of them. And, and, you know, whatever. James Quinn is his nephew. James Quinn is his nephew. And there was another, uh, Foley was shot. He actually looked like he would die in 2008, didn't he? It was really, he was shot a number of times at really close range. Um, as the police arrived at the scene, he gave a name to the police um, of who shot him. Well, he did said he just gave them a name mm. um, and that person would ultimately end up in prison again as part of the the the, the feud, uh, the Kinnan Hutch feud, uh, Dean Howe. Yeah, OK. So Dean Howe was also the name given. Um, um, Dean Howe is currently serving uh, an uh, I think it's eight years for conspiracy to kill Gary Hanley, mm-hmm. a Hutch, Hutch associate. And James Quinn, of course, would have had the ability to um, arrange to meet his uncle. He would. They were, he was working with the Kinahan organization yeah. at that stage, a childhood friend of Daniel Kinahan's um, and ha- was a bare knuckle boxer. Essentially, the uncle, J- Martin Foley, it would be said, almost blooded him in bare knuckle boxing and used to bring him to these kind of fights in the mountains, illegal kind of fights and all the rest of it. So they were close enough. But James Quinn would go on to show his ultimate loyalty to the Kinahan organization when he was arrested in 2016 for the murder of Gary Hutch in the September of 2016. He was found living on a yacht. Yeah. He was found with a photograph of Daniel Kinahan's mother. Yeah. A dog-eared photograph of it in his wallet that he yeah. was carrying around. She was obviously as much as a mother to him as he had, yeah. you know, from from what those who knew him said. He was also at that point in 2016, so that is eight years after this shooting of his uncle, he's working full time for the Kinnan organization as their in-house hitman, yeah. as their fully staffed up hitman. He's living on the Costa, he's paid a wage, and when he does a hit, he is given a bonus, basically. Yeah. And going around in an incredible yacht and, mm. you know, living the high life. Um, and I think at that point, that that attempted shooting and ultimately Foley survived. I think that probably was the end of him as a as a high level player. Uh, high level player. Yeah. What he became then was, as we talked about, he set up um, this debt collection service, and he really, uh, while he fought against the notoriety, obviously against the Sunday World, and brought the paper to court. This became his uh, retirement plan, really, didn't it? Mm, mm. His notoriety. Um, now, so over, over the last 15 years, how many times have we done stories and all the other papers about local businessman says I was, you know, Foley Mark called into called my house. Yeah. There's been discussions in, in by politicians calling up for it to be banned. There's been so many of them, isn't there? There was one yeah. recently there where there was somebody took a video of him saying, you know, he was asking for debt. He didn't threaten violence. And when your man says, who are you? And he says, Google me. Yeah. So it's gone on and on. Um, You'd wonder do people know him. He's a very familiar face, obviously, to us, but... Yeah. um, I think he... Do still know him? And uh, he's 67 now, going around. Well, my parents would know who Martin Foley is, where they wouldn't have a clue who who James Quinn is, if you know what I mean. yeah. So he does have a notoriety. Um, A lot of it seems to be in rural Ireland, doesn't it? Yeah, Um, a lot of the debt collection seems to be around the country. And a lot of it is to do with kind of uh, broadly construction and, and, you know... That sort of yeah, business. And, and of the cash. likes of what we, you know, is he was most recently in court yeah. for the collecting of rent. Yeah. I mean, you're not, you're never talking six figure sums. No, you're never so you're talking, uh, you know, thousands or maybe, or, maybe a bit above. Yeah. Um, and it's gone on for years, hasn't it? We've, yeah. the, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, there's been 
loads of He has a, a, a small child as well, like he, with his current yeah. partner. He, he um, was, because I remember when that child was born and myself and Ernie, I think, were in Crumlin and we sort of thought we'd just swing by, see how things mm. were. And he was standing outside his house and he looked over and saw me and he had the baby and a bottle. Yeah. And he managed to maneuver the whole thing to give me the two fingers. <laughs> Beautiful sight. Well, I have to say, fair play. Born baby in his arm, <laughs> bottle in his left, you know, crooked between the baby and his... Yeah, arm. I'm not sure. I wouldn't do the same. But uh, you not? <laughs> but either way, I mean, that that is really how he survived now. Yeah. Um, on, I think on his reputation. I mean, it's... It, does throw up an interesting question about who should be allowed to collect debts and Absolutely. what what legal structure we should have in place for that type of thing. And, yeah. you know, it's a certainly is a grey area, not just in, in terms of Martin Foley's behaviour. There's other, many other dodgy ways that are these things are being done. Um, nonetheless... He was only warned uh, most recently that his, his life remains under threat in 2020 when he got another gym form from the Gardaí, apparently he'd fallen out with associates of Troy Jordan, his one-time business partner, because they did part ways. Yeah, I mean, he had another little, uh, didn't he have another little minor feud with a guy known the Little General as well? That was He's a crotchety, f- yeah. like, guy, isn't he? Like, I think what stands out for me about Foley is that he falls out with everybody. He's yeah. always fighting with somebody. Yeah. He isn't somebody that lives under the radar. No. And he's very quick to use his fists, like yeah. as if he's still a young man, as if we're still yeah. living in an era when you can just do that without any repercussions. Yeah. I mean, our own colleague, Donald McIntyre, had a bit of a... He did. He did. ...go from him, didn't he? They, he did. He did. Sort of said to he punched him in the stomach. He did. He lost his, uh, he lost his temper at the time, uh, Foley and... and uh, Donald very, uh, uh, wouldn't be uh, necessarily an aggro type of guy, would he? Uh, no, he's, he's very good at, at keeping situations yeah. friendly, even bizarre situations that you'd be in. He's good at talking until... Yeah, until he, people, he sort of it tires you into sort of quietens it down. Into, quietens this, this yeah, situation, the situation down. down. So, but Maybe I mean... a good kind of mediator or something yeah. like that, but... Uh, yeah, so Foley, um, and of course he's he's still living in, in, in Crumlin and people say he's quite a pleasant neighbour, but um, yeah, he could end up in prison now. Um, I can't even think of when he no, would have... He could, he could manage if the maximum is two months, he's not going to be in for very long if they do put him in. No. He's, he's clever that he pleaded guilty to the lesser charge and didn't have to go on trial for threats you, to kill. I'd you, say his bigger problem is his, his Criminal Assets Bureau bill because in the end of the day, that's going to have to be paid at some stage or, or they'll come looking for the house. Or they'll never... Well, you know, you don't know what... Yeah, you know, it's it's hard to get blood out of a stone. But if you look back, what what did you say he was involved in uh, in terms of a, a pipe uh, fitter, was it? Or, or he was a tyre fitter. So you do wonder, like, if you look back, um, he's, he's here now, he's facing maybe a month or two in prison or, or not. He owes a load of money to the Criminal Assets Bureau and he's living in Crumlin, where he's lived for all, all that time. Yeah. Would he have been better off sticking with the tyre fitting? Well, he would, because actually I'd say you make a good living out of that. He would, he would, yeah, he'd be on the pig's back and he'd be retiring and maybe could have yeah. bought a little place in Spain as well if he'd stuck with that. And, you know, Martin Foley's still alive and that's... Doesn't he go to the Gran Canaries or somewhere that he goes all the time on his... I think so, but you would you would think this is, you know, Foley, we say, is a great survivor and he is one of the few of his contemporaries who's still alive. Mm, well, that is in itself. But has it all been worth it? I don't know. I mean, when I did the sum and I thought, you know, driving to Gorey to go and threaten a 68 year old pensioner yeah. over unpaid rent, which whatever's going on there, I don't know. But most people who haven't paid their rent can't afford to pay it. Yeah. And you can't, as you say, get blood out of a stone. Yeah. But to do that, I mean, it would take you the day. Yeah. Right. First yeah. of all. Yeah. There's the insurance, the tax and the vehicle. Yeah the diesel or the petrol, whatever that goes into it. Yeah. Paying the guy, the co-accused, whose name was Alan Nulty, and he, of course, pleaded guilty um, yeah, to that. Yeah, suspended he sentence. Yeah. suspended sentence. You have to pay your, your sidekick. Yeah. Um, and you probably got to buy your lunch and, you Stop know... Stop in the Barack Obama Plaza or whatever it is yeah, and get your lunch. get your lunch. Um, you know, you're more than likely going to get a phone call during the day to go and get this. We need this, this and yeah. this and this. 
pocket change would you have left from that? I don't know. Earning don't know. and yeah, and just the nature of the job in itself, like you know, yeah. the idea of going to, to threaten. Would you ever like? He must be so filled with anger and resentment and all the rest of it that you could you couldn't wake up every day in the mood to threaten someone. No, you, I, know, you can all get angry and we can all get a bit worked up about things and we will say things we don't. You know, we don't sort of cover ourselves in glory when we're feeling like that, dealing with people. Yeah. But to be constantly f- sort of ready to go to battle. Yeah, look, is, it's, it's, look, it's it is. a highly tense yeah. way to live your life. It is. And I suppose maybe you would think that some guy, poor guy, owns four grand. You wouldn't feel like being, an, you wouldn't feel like an ordinary, decent criminal, maybe pursuing that, though. People owe money and they yeah. entitled for it to be paid back to them. But I mean, yeah, he, he he's had a, an amazing life story. Um, there was always talk that he'd written an autobiography, but it's it's never seen the light of day. There was talk of late, of course, that he was claiming to know where certain works of art were. He denies that. He has been litigious himself in the past. He's yeah, tried to... He's least, trying to sue the BBC, is he? Well, he has ma- he has listed a case, but nothing has ever come of it yeah. over, over their claims that uh, to do with the Charlie Hill documentary. Um. And yeah, he's just a survivor, really. And yeah. you don't see him in in the, you don't see him dripping in designer no. gear or driving fast cars. Or he's obviously just always made a regular living, has he? I don't know. I mean, I just the interesting thing would be: will we still be talking about him in the twenty thirties, Nicola? God. Yeah. No, we won't. Yeah, not at all. No. So, what age would he be then? Ninety. No, <laughs> 70s. Seven years yeah, from sorry. now. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I always still feel like we're just at the beginning of the 2000s, <laughs> same way as I always still feel I'm 26. Maybe if I could get that straight in my head. Yeah. Um, do you not get a shock, though, sometimes? Well, I do. Go, I do. Something happened in 2001 yeah. and you go, that was 22 years ago. Yeah. Like, it doesn't feel like that was 22 years ago. It doesn't, no. Ago. I mean, I, yeah, like there was, yeah, I did. Even the 2000s, somebody's saying they're all wearing 2000s fashion. I'm thinking, yeah. oh, surely it's, that's the same as now. Is it? it is with you, <laughs> it is with me. Yeah, it is with me. <laughs> then again, I'm not going to Deep and Blue concerts, am I, Nicola? Which is not even the 2000s. No, no, I, I, I think that is perfectly acceptable. That's just a kind of... That's a, quite quite the modern little, and hip... Um, uh, just a little reach back into the past, really. But uh, What about calling The Weekend The Weekender, as no, you did? I, I, but I didn't. I called them The Weekends... Uh, and I actually was ahead of the game on that. I was the first one to buy the Weekend album. Yes. Out of a younger generation of people that I know. So. Well, I apologise then. Yeah. Um, right up there. Yeah. See, I'm not. I'm not, like. I'm not. I'm not able to deal with that about when it comes to age or anything <laughs> yeah, like no, that. No. Or just modernisation. But uh, maybe I'm a little bit like Foley in that way. Maybe he's, so. He definitely still feels he's a young man out there. Yeah. Like, he you know does. But anyway, um, so much there, really. And all those individuals, really, that have come into that. Yeah, it is incredible. Story are worthy of a, kind of a deep dive into them themselves. I mean, particularly that Paddy Shanahan. Like, yeah. We must get back to him. He's he's a fascinating character. That, yeah, absolutely. And John Cunningham and, and yeah. you know, all these guys. I still want to know where John Cunningham is. Yeah, if anybody yeah. knows where John Cunningham is, please let me know. Um, you know, we haven't laid eyes on him since, well, his brother, Michael Cunningham died, of course, he came back for the funeral and we got photographs of him then. But since realistically, we've no much information on him since 2010 when he was arrested during Operation Shovel, taken to jail and got bail along with Christy Kinahan Sr. But he hasn't been floating around that Kinahan organization since or doesn't certainly look look like he is. He certainly ain't in Dubai or hasn't had much to do with them since no. everything went a bit toxic. Um, as far as we know, anyway, yeah. As far as we know, but, you know, yeah. um, he could be just cleverer than the rest and lying low. Yeah. So, for the moment, we'll uh, we'll leave it at that. Well Thank done on the runners. Thank you very much, Nicola. Very proud of myself. 